Welcome to this edition of the Sword and the Trowel podcast. We're delighted to have you here. The Sword and the Trowel is a podcast of Founders Ministries, and Founders exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of local churches. I'm Tom Askell. And I'm Graham Gundon. Well, Graham, welcome again. Uh, we are now entering into the Christmas season, so mm-hmm. everybody's minds begin to turn toward uh, the celebration of Christmas, the recognition that indeed we have a Savior who was born, and uh, yet we don't really have anything in the Bible that tells us to celebrate Christmas, right? So do you right. celebrate Christmas? I do celebrate Christmas uh, against the... Uh the advice of my Puritan forefathers. <laughs> yeah, well, you can have that conversation in heaven, you know, about uh, whether or not we should do this. We even have a Christmas tree. You have a Christmas a tree, real Christmas that, tree, that pagan uh, icon yeah. from the sun god. Well, yeah. you know, yeah, we celebrate Christmas too, and I've worked through this, and I've kind of been on both ends of the spectrum uh, growing up. Christmas was a big deal, and then as I became aware of the Puritans reading them, loving them, I thought Christmas should not <laughs> be banned forever. And I've come back to it with this sense that, you know, uh, this, the birth of a king is a significant thing. It ought to be celebrated. And we don't have kings in the United States, but there are kings throughout history. There are kings today. And we are talking about the king of all kings who genuinely was born. Don't know exactly when he was born, but he was born. And so why should we, citizens of the heavenly kingdom, not celebrate the birthday of our king? And so we acknowledge that and take advantage of it and uh, try to keep it in its proper place as well. And speaking of Christmas, we have a sale that we started last week for Thanksgiving, and we're just going to extend it. There's been so many delays with mail, and uh, we've had difficulty with shipping that rather than trying to do a special Christmas sale, we're just going to continue the sale that we've got going on now. So I think you have to use a special code to get the, it's at 25% off of all of our uh, Mm -hmm. uh, books in the bookstore, and that code is Give Thanks. Give Thanks, all caps, no space. No space, all caps, Give Thanks. We've got a couple other things going on, too, we want to remind you about. The Founders Conference, the registrations uh, continue to come in, filling up. We're excited about what God's doing in preparation for this conference. The theme is Militant and Triumphant, the Doctrine of the Church. And we've got a wonderful group of guys coming in to teach us on this. So Vody Balkum and uh, Tom Buck will be a part of it. Conrad and Bayway, of course, Vody and Conrad coming from Lusaka, Zambia. We've got James Coates coming from Canada. And then also Travis Allen, who is pastor of Grace Church in Greeley, Colorado. Colorado, and all of these men will be coming down here to join us for this conference, a, a timely conference, a very important subject, the doctrine of the church. We desperately need to recover what the Bible says about the significance of the church. Uh, you know, the word ecclesia in the New Testament is the word that we translate church, and that is the right word for it. And that word means assembly. And yet we've had so many people talk about the church over the last couple of years that you can have a church and not assemble. And that just is one indication of why we need a conference like this. So I encourage you to sign up for it, register for the conference. You can do that at founders.org. And then also we've got Vody Balkum coming in to teach before the conference his course on cultural apologetics for the Institute of Public Theology. So this is going to be a knockout course. I've talked to Vody about it, looked over the syllabus and uh, the reading list and the things he intends to do. You can audit this course if you're not a student at IOPT, but we would encourage you to consider becoming a student of the Institute of Public Theology. You can get more information at uh, our Institute of Public Theology.org website for this course and the whole uh, lineup of what we're doing with the Institute over the next few years. So again, welcome to this podcast. What are we going to talk about today, Graham? Today we're going to talk about uh, marriage, and we're going to talk about wedding ceremonies. Wedding ceremonies and marriage. Well, we Mm -hmm. probably ought to have a special guest to do that, don't you think? I think that's appropriate. So why don't we welcome the lady who's usually behind the cameras, Hannah Askell, soon to be Ellis, to our studio. Hannah, thank you for joining us today on this side of the cameras. Well, you're welcome. I know you're desperate. (laughs) That's the only reason I'm here. No, we're doing this because Hannah is scheduled to be married at the end of this week. And uh, we're all excited about it around here. It's kind of been the main thing on our radar for a while and trying to make plans and preparations and people coming in from out of town. we got some family members coming in from out of town and church members that are excited and uh, have offered to help out as well. And so we thought we'd take the opportunity to talk to Hannah about marriage and the upcoming wedding because she's been thinking about it an awful lot. And it's really been a great thing to see how God has worked and guided in her life. And uh, she's done so much for founders and 
And again, most of it's behind the scenes. Some of you that have followed founders and been involved with the ministry for a while will know Hannah or know of Hannah because you've been working officially for founders for how many years? Um, close to five. Five years and full time over the last three years or four years, something yeah, like that. About. Yeah. So what's your official title? Uh, Director of Media Communications. Director of Media Communications. And what do you do in that title, oh, with that title? Anything you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. If only I'd given her that title when she was a little girl. <laughs> um, no, mostly all of the, the social media things. So anything on for IOPT or founders under anything social media that covers all of our YouTube, all of our media production. So podcasts, normally I'm on the other side of the studio. Um, anything with conference that has to do with media. So recording interviews, things of that nature. Um, when we contract out with other producers, things like that, uh, all of the marketing as well, and then pretty much anything else that kind of falls in between. So, what's it like working for your dad? Oh man, that's a whole nother <laughs> podcast, Graham. <I'll> cut, cut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, you There's know, I've no gotten that cut. question quite a bit. What's it like working for your dad? What's it like working for the Tom Maskell? <laughs> It's a whole nother episode. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> that, that one will not be shot live. I can assure you this, okay? We'll have to edit that multiple times. No, mm-hmm. Hannah, we're glad to have you here. And again, you're just a couple of days away from uh, walking down an aisle and me giving you to a young man that, uh, you know, he's signed multiple contracts with me already about how right. he's going to take care of you and how he's going to treat you and all. No, Ryan's a great guy. Uh, he loves Christ. He loves the church mm-hmm. and he's faithful in serving Christ and serving the church. And uh, he's demonstrated his love and determination to serve you as well. So tell us a little bit about uh, how you came to be convinced <laughs> that this is the guy. <laughs> Well, it was not a um, short process. I've known Ryan. We met probably a little over five years ago now, I think. Mm-hmm. And for, he came to the church. Yes, yeah. He's, mm-hmm. So he came to Grace. And um, for about four and a half of those years, he has been very interested in me. And I did not reciprocate. Mm. A lot of that time. That was very so. unkind. Of <laughs> I know. I know. It took a lot longer you just for sure. me to see the Lord's plan than it did for Ryan. Yeah. Um, but no, so we affectionately call this current season that we're in season four. <laughs> <laughs> and if that gives you any kind of indication of just the kind of uh, story that we've had has been Ryan pursuing and being very patient for a very long time and me taking a lot longer to get there. So at one point I even told him, um, I will not marry you. And I'm just not going to marry you. And what a guy. I know. Yeah, I, I know. He he <laughs> stuck around and the Lord had a better plan. And I'm very happy to be wrong in my ignorant statement that I made. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we were friends um, for most of those five years and had same circles of community in our church. And he was friends with a lot of my brothers. And so um, we hung out quite a bit and he was interested. And we, you know, would go on random coffee dates and didn't really go well or maybe wasn't the best and didn't really pursue anything quite seriously until this year. You said date. Tell me, <laughs> tell me more, Graham. I was saying, it's an interesting word to, to use in some Christian community. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Like, you want a is. Christian, you want a coffee courtship. Co- you know a coffee courtship. Yes, that's no. right. No. So yeah, we went over, we went multiple times just hanging out and, and kind of getting to know each other more and then more seriously this year in what we call season four. Yeah. The, going for the grand finale. Well, you and know, season in, five starts next week. Wednesday, That's right. Yeah. 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 Friday, yeah. whatever day. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but it is a, a, a wonderful picture of uh, pursuit mm-hmm. and determination and, uh, you know, a guy who, I mean, you, you know, you got to handle these things wisely and carefully. And uh, one of the things that has impressed me about Ryan is mm-hmm. how he has conducted himself mm-hmm. in the midst of all that uncertainty. And yet, you know, he's prayed and tried to understand God's will and not try to manipulate you with that. Right. I mean, I've known yep. guys that have gone up to girls and say, hey, God told me to marry you. you know? <laughs> we had a girl like that in high school and this guy just out of the blue, out of the blue came and said, God told me that you're supposed to be my wife. She said, okay. No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> they got married. They're still married oh, as far as I know, gosh. you know, so they were both Christians and uh, it seems like it's working out. But anyway, that's, yeah. he didn't do that. He did not. No, he just very patiently, um, and very, I mean, just in a godly way, really maturely did not push mm-hmm. beyond, you know, um, was very just patient and, and pursued me in a way that I was not, um, I could not have dreamed to, to have had such a patient and, and godly man yeah. in that way. And, and was just incredibly, um, 
pleading with the Lord that it would work out and <laughs> the Lord heard his prayers. So, yeah. um, and many other people's prayers, a lot of people in our church were praying to the same end yeah. and God worked on me and through our relationship and, and helped us through a lot of really hard conversations and, and a lot of growth. We had a lot of growth separately and, and that was, um, gave us a really sweet foundation this year as we dated and got engaged and now towards marriage, um, a lot more communication and trust there because Mm -hmm. of the story, though it is not the one that we would have chosen. It is much more glorifying to the Lord in the way that he chose to write it. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I've witnessed in both of you is just how you continue to grow in grace, uh, Mm -hmm. repentance and faith and just seeing that worked out. And um, it's, it's been great as your dad and uh, pastor, just kind of watching this thing happen to see it move to this place Mm -hmm. has been great. So Graham, you're going to help officiate this wedding coming up this week and I'll help officiate the wedding too. That's right. So uh, you've kind of watched this. You've been a friend of Ryan's (laughs) for a while. So Give us your take on just thoughts of uh, how God works generally and then specifically in this relationship, yeah. things that we can learn. Well, it is amazing. So Ryan and I have been close really since the beginning, since season one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Whole series. Uh, and the ups and downs. Um, and no, no what, I'm, what I'm struck with in this whole, um, in all the different episodes, is <laughs> the way in which God works through particular personalities. Mm. Right? You know, the Lord uses means to accomplish his will. He He doesn't normally just make a miracle happen, right? He does, but but not all the time. And um, and so the way that the Lord used Ryan and his particular personality and his persistence and his patience and his willingness to keep going back <laughs> and keep getting turned down <laughs> and um, and you know praise God for yeah. it. Um, and mm-hmm. I think I think he's going to bless it. I think he's going to bless you guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you've got a wedding coming up, and uh, you've been thinking about that. And you're also a professional photographer. A lot of people don't know that about you. Uh, I didn't know that about you until you finally convinced me by looking at your website that, hey, people really do pay you to do this. You know? <laughs> I mean, it was like an eye-opening moment for me a few years ago. I just thought it was a hobby, you know, and she kept going off doing these things and coming back talking about her shoot. And I said, well, show me what you're doing. So I looked at her website and said, this is incredible. You actually do this. You know? And then you started charging her rent. <laughs> that's right. right. Yeah. And right. Then, yeah, that's right. And uh, then I understood why she charged me to take a picture of me. You know? so, uh, <laughs> uh, so you've you've shot a lot of weddings. Right. So you've been involved in dozens of weddings yeah. probably, yeah. right? So you've seen it from that angle. Mm-hmm. And that informed some of your thinking about mm-hmm. what you wanted for your own wedding. But uh, you've also thought of it from the standpoint of a Christian, and you and Ryan both, as we've talked together, have been very clear that you want Jesus Christ to be the focal point, not the bride Mm -hmm. uh, at the wedding. You want him to be honored in the whole ceremony as well as in the the coming together to establish a new Christian home. So tell us a little bit about uh, your thinking process that you've gone through in planning a wedding because that's Mm -hmm. something that people who want to get married and move toward marriage have to think about. Yeah, I think, well, I have, I've been in the wedding industry for close to six years now and it is, it is a hard industry to be in. It's a really joyful industry to be in. Um, You're there for people's happiest days of their life. So it's a lot of fun and I really enjoy it, but um, it has definitely been eye opening. Um, You really get to see the the whole spectrum. So you have the the small weddings and I've had the joy of doing all of it um, in terms of really high end, big, extravagant, big people wedding, you know, ton mm. of guests, things like that. And then really small, intimate ceremonies. And they're all really sweet in their own way. Um, and both secular and Christian weddings. And mm. so that definitely informs in, in both regards. But um, yeah, I think what one thing that was amazing to me was that though Ryan and I come from incredibly different backgrounds and, and upbringings and we have different personalities and things that are important to us was that we were very unified in what we wanted our wedding to look like. Mm. Um, and that's the, the grace of the Lord just shaping our minds and, and helping us to come to the same conclusions about what things are important, what things are the most important and the highest priorities and what things are appropriate because it is a joyful celebration and because it is uh, a glorious day and it mm-hmm. should reflect the glory of the Lord and the joy of the Lord and everything that you do in it. Um, but also keeping the the most important things, the most important things and letting everything else kind of fall to the, the that's the gravy. If it happens, great. If not, it's okay. Um, and so I think that the wedding industry, it's interesting, is so incredibly secular. Even, um, 
quote unquote Christian weddings uh, are so shaped by culture and you Mm. don't see them shaped by biblical principles. You see them shaped by things that our culture says are good and right. Like Pinterest. Um, Yeah. Like Pinterest. Pinterest is great. I use Pinterest. (laughs) I have a Pinterest wedding board. Pinterest is like Uh, the um, modern day hope chest. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, it's, it can be amazing. Like anything, it can be a really good gift from the Lord, or it Mm. can also be um, a really terrible thing that just completely, you can make an idol out of and just stirs up all of this discontentment and idolatry in your heart. Um, but Pinterest has made the wedding industry just crazy. Mm. I mean, I have seen ridiculous things and, um, worked weddings that though beautiful, I know how much they cost and it breaks my heart a little bit because it, it definitely affects the emphasis of the day. Mm. Um, and even just a practical thing, usually the ceremony is the shortest part of the day. And in a lot of weddings that I do, it's, you know, five, 10 minute ceremony. People want to get it over with, get it done. And then everything else is what is amplified. Um, so yeah, I think Ryan and I definitely, we came into it both very much on the same page of, we wanted it to be with our church. Um, though he joked about eloping multiple times, even this last week, he said, Hey, you know, it's not too late. I actually (laughs) offered him. You did. You made a great (laughs) offer. I declined. He was ready. He was ready to go for it. Um, but yeah, so we, we did, it was very important to us to be with our church. And I think there, there's some biblical, um, thinking behind that for both of us and just wanting to have the church as our witness Mm -hmm. and have a cloud of witnesses surrounding us and people that can testify that yes, this is a godly, holy covenant and we are committing to hold you accountable to this covenant and to be with you along the way and help you in your marriage and your family and all of those things. And so that was incredibly important to us. And so that starting out, you know, we have a big Mm. church and Mm. so having it with our church makes it a countercultural wedding because it's a big wedding and that's Mm. not the thing anymore. Elopements are very much the thing and you want it. It's your day and you keep your people and, and make it about you. And then you can spend more money on the things that you really want to do. And, and people, that is the, the number one tip that, vendors give to brides is to you cut guests so then you can do the things that you want to do oh, really? don't have a big yeah no you don't have a big wedding that's very that's very opposite um you keep it small so then you can have the really fancy xyz you can do oh. the really fun you because know, it doesn't whatever. matter how many people are there to experience the wedding right. it matters how many people see the pictures <laughs> that's on social right. media yeah. and how it many people true. send gifts right, so, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> so for us i mean that was starting out we would i would tell people, you know, who we all invited and how many people we invited. And it was just shocking. Mm. Um, but it was a sweet testimony. You know, we had to really fight to keep the list though big, you know, of, of people that were invited as small as it was, because it was just sweet. We had so many people where we realized had impacted our life and being involved in our relationship and in our upbringing and who meant a lot of, uh, you know, a lot to us and people outside of our church, friends and family. So, going through all that, that was important. We wanted it to be with our church. Um, we wanted it to be God glorifying. And so that automatically shapes, you know, down to the music that you choose and the dress that you wear and the structure and timeline of your day. What do you, what things do you allow to happen? What things you say are not going to happen? Um, and then we wanted the ceremony specifically to be the emphasis. And so for that reason, it is you're preaching a sermon at the Mm -hmm. ceremony, which is not normal. Um, I had a, a dear lady, um, tell me, she said, oh, the ceremony's going to go really quick. I said, well, you've clearly never been to one of my dad's weddings. <laughs> Wait, how long is this ceremony? <laughs> um, get ready. I have bring, to stand there. Bring a comfy chair. No, no, no. Y'all are going to sit down. We're going to have the whole wedding <laughs> party sit down. Okay. I wouldn't do that to them. So. Um, but that, I mean, that is, is shocking to people mm-hmm. because it really is. You get through the ceremony so then you can get to the party and, you know, you celebrate. And that's great. And you want to have the joy there. But it was really important to us to have the gospel proclaimed because marriage is a picture of the gospel. And mm-hmm. it's such a tangible example of Christ and the church and, um, his sacrifice and and death on the cross. And so we, it was very important to us to have that really clearly proclaimed in the entire day, but specifically articulated at the ceremony. Mm. So that's, you know, the reason that we asked you to do that. And it's an unusual thing. Um, but all of those things kind of shaped our thinking and it's, it's very, opposite of of what is standard and I think I had a lot of people in the industry surprised because usually when you have somebody who's who's worked the weddings and seen all the things you you want them to have this really you expect them to have this really spectacular you know Pinterest perfect wedding and mine is far from but I'm excited about it yeah you know I was uh, looking uh, on a website uh, called weddingstats.org and you know what the average cost of a wedding in the United States is for 2021 
around 50,000 probably. No, over 30,000. 30,000. Okay. You've been doing those I was high gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually, yeah, it's, it's unfortunately in, smaller than I thought. In, in uh, New York, in uh, New York City, it's over 70,000. Yep. But in Utah, it's only like 13,000. <laughs> My kind of people. But in Cape Coral, Florida, it's <laughs> like 5,000. Yeah. I think. Yeah. You know? so, I mean, so you've done this on a budget. Yep. Right? And uh, that means that there are some things like you're not having, uh, as we saw, we looked last night at monogrammed cookies that you could have for your wedding. So you're, you're not, not doing you're that. You're not getting me those? I'm, I'm monogram them for you. Yeah, bring them over outside. <laughs> hey, those would probably go for a pretty good price, though. <laughs> I wouldn't eat them. <laughs> no, I wouldn't either. Uh, so, I mean, you've just you've made yeah, things right. intentionally simple. <laughs> yep. You've not tried to be extravagant, mm-hmm. and uh, that goes from everything in terms of uh, how the wedding party will be dressed mm-hmm. right. to who will be in the wedding party and what kind of reception you're going to have, right? Mm-hmm. So you just kind of thought through all that and tried to keep it on a budget. You've right. actually operated on a budget. We have, yeah, we have. And that was um, important to both of us. And uh, there's no reason for it to, A, number one, be a financial burden for anyone. Mm-hmm. Um, and two, I think when you have a budget and that structure, it's a lot easier to kind of sort out what is priority, where you're going to spend your money. And it, it, it becomes like a boundary to help you not make it an idol. Mm -hmm. Um, Because when you have an open-ended budget or a large budget, that's not inherently sinful. There's nothing wrong with that. If you're able to do that, if God's giving you the means, that's great. Have a really amazing party and celebrate in Mm -hmm. the joy of the Lord. Um, But when you have those boundaries in that structure, it, it really makes you be thoughtful about everything that you yeah. do. You're not just throwing money left and right and saying, well, I like that and that's beautiful. You, you're really having to give attention and thought behind every decoration and what things are communicating and where you're going to spend um, your efforts yeah. and, your, and your money. And I think it, it makes you get creative too, which is just great. It, you know, you can you do so many DIY things and um, makes you get other people involved. We've had an amazing... Um, group of people from our church who are uh, doing all sorts of stuff for the wedding. And there's, I've told, I don't even know how many times I've said it in this planning process is I could not imagine getting married without a church Mm -hmm. family, Mm -hmm. Um, spiritually and emotional support as well. But even just practically, we've got Mm -hmm. ladies in the church who are making all of the food for the, for the reception. And that's just incredible. And that's Mm -hmm. not because we have an unusual church. We just have a sweet church and God's been kind to us. And so things like that, it makes you think outside the box and it really helps you to keep it in its proper place. Yeah. Just think how much more cheaply you could have done this wedding if the pastor wasn't charging you so much. I yeah. know. I know. It's the highest bill there is. Hey, so um, you guys have mentioned a couple times elopement. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what are your thoughts on someone who does just merely elope? Um, is that are they considered married if they just have the sanction of the state? Does the sanction of the state matter at mm-hmm. all when it comes to marriage? Can somebody just have a ceremony without signing a, a marriage uh, license or anything like that? Yeah, I think the state does have a role to play. Uh, it, this is a creation ordinance, and uh, the state is designed by God to manage how we live in this world so that we can do the things God's called us to do. When the state's fulfilling its responsibilities and does that well, then you know we are blessed and can live quiet lives Um, with all dignity. And so, yeah, I think that it is proper to have, under normal circumstances, the state recognize and establish the parameters for this. That's why the Obergefell decision by the Supreme Court was such a moral and civic disaster. It was horrific for a state to, or the, the United States to sanction weddings contrary to what the law of Christ is, contrary to the law of nature mm-hmm. that God has woven into creation. So elopement, mm-hmm. it can be legit. I mean, in, in Florida, a boat captain uh, can marry you and you're married. Uh, you can go before a judge and get married and that would be legitimate. And so I, I think it's appropriate. Now, here's what I don't think is appropriate. It's two people just decide, hey, we're going to get married, just go do it. I mean, there's certainly... Uh, wisdom and an abundance of counselors and for Christians, Mm -hmm. you ought to be seeking counsel of those who know you, those who care for you, those who have some measure of responsibility for you. So for somebody in your situation, Mm -hmm. I mean, young people, you've got parents that you have some uh, responsibility to and that they have some responsibility for you. And then you have a church. Mm -hmm. And so to seek the counsel of the elders in the congregation Mm -hmm. and other people in the congregation, I think is very wise, but I wouldn't say that's illegitimate. I do think, including the church, mm-hmm. so if you're going to do that, I'd say, man, throw a party at some point right. so yep. that the people in your lives, the, the church, can come celebrate what God's done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and you and Ryan have sought counsel. So mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about that. What's the process been like 
in preparing for this marriage? Yeah, so we, um, we've done premarital counseling. We started that pretty quickly after we got engaged, but even before we got engaged, um, even before we started dating, we both were seeking counsel from mm-hmm. people in our church. And some of those were elders. Some of those were friends. Graham was definitely one of those people. You were definitely one of those people. Um, and we were both separately with honestly, without even knowing that the other was, we were seeking counsel from other people and, um, praying and spending time in the word and trying to just pursue the Lord and through every step and trying to be wise in all things. And then in that continued into dating we met with you guys you know you and mom and we talked with Graham and Sarah we talked with um, other elders and and tried to just continue to be really wise and seek the Lord and then that even more so in engagement that became a more formal structure Mm -hmm. in premarital counseling and so we've read books we've done um, different studies and and exercises and um, not compatibility tests anything like that but um just, what, what's you know, your enneagram <laughs> what's my enneagram yeah i don't, I don't know 25 is that a number um and but we've we've really tried to be very intentional and it's not so much um you know looking oh can i can i marry this person it's not so much looking for like let me let me see if there's a sign or a green flag and let me figure out if mm-hmm. this is the, the perfect thing if i can say with total confidence this is the right person but more seeking the lord and establishing um clear biblical principles for marriage for um your own spiritual growth because the the relationship with the lord is what will shape the relationship with your spouse and and just digging in deep to what god has to say about marriage and and christians relating to each other and mm-hmm. conflict resolution and all of those things um and that took on a four more formal structure once we were engaged in yeah. premarital counseling with the elders you know one of the things um, as a father uh with uh daughters the guys that have married my daughters so far, and this includes Ryan as of this week, <laughs> uh, they've come to me to talk to mm-hmm. me, first of all. And, you know, you got to be careful when you ask them about what all they went through, because some of them, they just elaborate. <laughs> and, you know, I think their memories are a little bit bad. But anyhow, they, I mean, they do, uh, they read some books, they meet mm-hmm. with me, and uh, we just talk about it. And one of the things that I've used is a principle of how does a guy handle his finances? Yep. Because, uh, you know, Jesus <laughs> says that if you're not faithful with what is another's, who will trust you with real riches when he's talking about finances? And so I've used that and with guys said, look, how much money do you have in the bank? You know, are you in debt? And if they're in debt, if they don't have money in the bank, they're not saving, they're not, they're not living within their means. The question in my mind, and sometimes I've actually verbalized this, is why should I trust you with my daughter when you can't even handle money? Mm-hmm. You know, money's about the least important thing you'll ever handle. And mm-hmm. if you're just squandering money and you can't be wise with that, and you want me to give you my daughter? You know, let's let's talk about this a little bit more. So we've I've used that. Kind right. of, just as an arbitrary standard. I mean, I've said, okay, you need to have 5000 bucks in the bank or 10000 bucks in the bank, depending on the situation, and give them a goal to work for. And if they're willing to work for that, well, that, that indicates to me, okay, here's a guy that's really got some uh, – some seriousness about him and it hadn't been the same for all the guys but it has been that principle i want to see some responsibility over here before you uh, think that you're prepared to take on uh, mm-hmm. a wife well and i think that plays into to having a wedding budget is very it's a very similar structure of mm-hmm. that has helped us form our budget for our marriage mm-hmm. and so first the you know ryan specifically working on finances with you and and um, having goals and working hard to reach them and all of those things. And then doing the wedding budget and sticking to that and being thoughtful about that. Like both of those things have heavily influenced our finances going to marriage. We've already made a budget and we've looked towards that. And so that's just helpful, practical things along the way as well. Yeah. And it's been great. So how much in debt are you going for your wedding? Zero dollar. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and that's a great thing, yeah. isn't it? Because uh, it just it sets you free to be able to to look honestly mm-hmm. at options and what God might have for you to do. You're not having to think, "Oh no, I got this burden of uh, financial debt that I've got to deal with." Right. So that's wonderful. Well, um, what other counsel? What one piece of counsel would you give to a woman who is contemplating marriage? I think the biggest thing the Lord has helped me with is realizing that the sin that I have. And the struggles that I have in singleness don't change just because I'm in a relationship or because I'm going to be married. Um, there was a lot of things that, that I was not sharply aware of. You know, I could, I knew there were things that I struggled with maybe sometimes, but being in that close of community with somebody and that close relationship with somebody brings them very much to light. Just wait. 
Right. <laughs> so that's what I've heard. <laughs> you start you know? squeezing from the same tube of toothpaste, man, boom, everything uh, comes out. I have heard it will only become amplified <laughs> in, in marriage. Um, but yeah, I've, I, you know, I knew that I had selfish tendencies. I had no idea how selfish I was. Mm. I knew that I was prideful. I had no idea how prideful and stubborn I was. And so having to work through those things and I think, you know, some of those pet sins that you just kind of let ride when you don't really have somebody right up in your space, really calling them out. Um, it's easy and, and there can be some of assumption where I'll, I, you know, I'm not content now, but once I'm in that mm-hmm. relationship, then I'll be content or I'm not, I don't really have to work hard on this sin now. I don't really have to be in the word now I'll become that way. And I'll, I'll reach that holiness when I'm X, Y, Z. And that is not the case. And mm-hmm. so dealing with that, um, I think is huge and, and just really trying to be holy and godly where God has you and content in that season and trusting the Lord. And it's no different. It's daily trusting, obeying, repenting, believing. Um, and that has Ryan and I have had to walk through that in dating and, and engagement and our engagement season was, um, difficult in a lot of ways. We've had some just unique situations come up that were really hard. And so God, brought even more opportunity for us to work through those things, Mm -hmm. um, things that we probably wouldn't have had to really touch too much until marriage. And yet in God's perfect providence, and even though it seems like a severe mercy, um, allowed us to kind of even be more unified and, um, working through, you know, the nitty gritty of your heart and, and struggles with sin and just, um, trusting the Lord and, and fear and anxiety and all those things that come up, but not, I think that was, that was the, a big thing that I just kind of assumed some of those sins that I was letting kind of ride, you mm-hmm. know, low ground when I was single, I just assumed a lot of that would just be, you know, resolved when I'm happy <laughs> and content in a relationship. And if anything, they just reared their ugly head more mm-hmm. and uh, we've had to deal with them a lot more. Um, and that, I'm going to say one more. Okay. Um, I think also realizing that when you have a biblical relationship and a, a godly wedding, it is intent. It should be intentionally countercultural, um, and that goes into planning a wedding and and the way you work your relationship. But the culture, everything the culture has in the wedding industry and in marriage and all those things, you even see like the distortion of marriage and um, same sex marriage and all of the things that have been so twisted and warped and divorce rates and um, you have an opportunity to be incredibly countercultural in the mm. way that you plan your wedding and the way that you work out your relationship and the boundaries that you set and the things that you do. Um, and it's not that you are just, you know, trying to, to get a rise out of the culture, but you have an opportunity to push back, push back darkness in the way that you operate mm-hmm. as a couple in dating engagement and then in marriage and, and wedding planning fits mm-hmm. right in there. And so that is just, that's been a really cool thing to, I've taken a lot of joy in just knowing that I am doing things so differently that it will stand out yeah. um, and not in a look at us kind of way, but just look at what the Lord can do and that we we're trying to put the priority on things that are the most important and that have eternal value, not the things that are, our culture wants us to, to emphasize. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's really good. Yeah. That's a lot of wisdom there. And, um, to uh, the, what you said about marriage doesn't fix things mm-hmm. and what you are when you enter into marriage is what you're going to be right. after marriage. And you're either going to take God seriously and Christ's gospel seriously, or you're not. Mm-hmm. And so, and what I, I've, you've heard this before, but all my counsel ultimately boils down to this, you know, be a real Christian and act like it. Right. Mm-hmm. And you got to do that as a single person. You're going to have to do that as a married person, and as you both seek Christ individually, you'll be able to seek Christ together mm-hmm. more effectively. Mm-hmm. And if you're not encouraging one another to do that as the ultimate goal, the ultimate concerns that you have, then you know you can go awry in a number of ways. Right. So you're going to be married, God willing, at the end of this week. It's a plan. So, uh, <laughs> man, are, will you interrupt your honeymoon to come back and do a podcast next week? I will not. My will fiance not? said no. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> hey, wait. <laughs> what a tyrant. Fiance. It's not your yeah. husband yet. That's right. That's true. That's you know, right. it's yeah. true. That submit doesn't come in until Friday. <laughs> uh, no, but he's telling you ahead of time what he's yeah, going to do, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So we won't have a podcast next week. Hope you understand. Hannah's taking a <laughs> couple of days off, which she rightly deserves. And we appreciate you uh, watching, tuning in, listening to us today. Pray for Hannah and Ryan as you think of them that God will give them a good start and that their wedding will honor Jesus Christ and more than that that their marriage will honor Jesus Christ and that uh, through their marriage many people will come to know Christ because of the grace that he pours out on them. 
So thanks for joining us today. Hannah, thanks for being with us.